number eight is that the Green Party is uh, uh, perhaps the only party. I'm not sure, but uh, it's in our it's in our platform that we support reparations. So there's actually a quote from a platform there that we commit to full and complete reparations to the African American community of this nation for the past 400 plus years of genocide, slavery, land loss, destruction of identity, and stark disparities. Um, you know, including education and jobs and um, uh, higher levels of mortality, and uh, especially what's going on today, mass incarceration. So, uh, you know, part of our social justice platform and all is is recognizing this racial disparity here and this this legacy of, uh, you know, racism and white supremacy and all that has gone through American history. Um, you know, the Green Party has it in a platform and, and, you know, we're not afraid to admit that and to say that we have to work toward that um, with a community led effort for reparations. Right. Um, and that's not something that you'll see in any other party. In fact, I think I feel like someone had tried to push to put this in the Democratic Party platform in 2020 and it failed. You know, like the, the Democratic Party elites, of course, we're not going to touch this. <laughs> well, historically, there was H. B40. I may be wrong on that number, um, but historically there was a, a bill that was, um, you know, for decades introduced in the Congress with the goal of, you know, starting the process of studying reparations, which is kind of mm -hmm. is the first step you have to take, right? Figuring out mm -hmm. what exactly are we talking about. And it was one of those bills that was always put up when the Republicans had control. And then when the Democrats came into power, all of a sudden it was miraculously missing. Uh, <laughs> right. It was never raised and, and you know pushed when they had the actual power to, to pass it. And we, it's not just you know limited to reparations for you know the African American community. We have whole section on indigenous rights, right? Yes. And, and, and platform sections on. And I saw a post recently on one of the Green Party pages about reparations. And someone said, well, what about indigenous reparations? And why isn't it in this section? Of, oh, it's because we just updated our set, our platform on uh, regarding reparations for, you know, African-Americans. And the response was, oh, it's, it's a different, it's a whole other platform section. Like, you know, indigenous rights has their own area. Mm -hmm. um, we deal with this and it, indigenous rights are a whole other type of reparations, right? Because we're talking about, you know, independent nations here. Um, and, and so one thing that, you know, the reparations issue, open borders, support for boy, BDS, boycott, divestment, and sanctions, um, the Green Party is a liberatory party, mm -hmm. right? Um, we're not looking at, um, we're not talking about, you know, diversity quotas, and things like that that you'll get out of you know liberal politicians um you know we're not talking about you know lgbtq or women ceos of raytheon and shell right um we're talking about liberatory we take a liberatory stance on a lot of these policies um you know with things like reparations with things like open borders um you know so i i think it's a huge another huge area where there's a vast difference mm -hmm. uh, you know oh, yeah just with open borders, I mean, the the most deporting president in history was Barack Obama, and I haven't looked at the numbers in probably about a year, but early on in Joe Biden's presidency, he was on pace to out-deport Obama, um, and he has kept many of Trump's awful immigration policies in place, right? Mm -hmm. um, despite the fact that the Republicans are yelling at that and, and trying to make a campaign point, I get things all the time in of my political junk mail that says that the Democrats are pushing for open borders and it's just not true. <laughs> they are, you know, actually in many, in most cases, worse than the, than the Republicans in their actual enforcement. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, yeah. I do want to go back to the peace one real quick because Brewers Pilot said, how did we settle on 75% mm. military budget cut? Why not a higher percent? Um, as someone who is heavily involved in how he's campaigned during the the kind of creation of our proposal that was 75%, um, there's a few reasons. One, 75% is a start, right? It, it's it, decommissioning the military is gonna it's gonna take decades. Um, I didn't realize this till I started, you know, working on this policy proposal as, as part of the campaign. We have three times as many nuclear reactors on Navy ships. Than we do in commercial operation in the United States. 
right? And aircraft carriers have multiple nuclear reactors. Um, it's going to take decades to decommission those, right? Um, it's going to take decades to deal with the depleted uranium that we put in things. And, you know, we're talking about really awful toxic stuff. Um, so 75% was a start. It was phase one. Um, the other, you know, I, I was on a panel with someone during the campaign and they postured as I, I would cut it 100%. And I responded and I said, well, then who's going to defend your socialist revolution? <laughs> we need a military if we're going to make these changes because capitalist countries will try to respond, right? There will be a back capitalist backlash. There will be, you know, right-wing militias rising up in this, in this country to try to push back the gains of any socialist movement. Um, so there is a need for a level of self-defense, right? A level of national defense um, that we that we at least in the short term will have to maintain. Um, but the real the big thing for the seventy five percent is it's the start, right? We start doing it and we see where things are going to go. Um, but the other half of it is any rebel, any socialist, you know, movement, every socialist transformation. Is going to face a major back put, you know, backlash from the right, uh, both domestically and internationally, and we'll we will need a way to uh, try to defend ourselves. And um, also, we're when we're talking about the military, um, just like other workers, they we need to make sure they have a just transition, right? One of the one of the be probably one of the quickest ways to end your socialist revolution is to unilaterally fire the entire military immediately. Um, you have well-trained, well-armed people who will just, it's coup time, right? And we, we actually kind of saw this with what we did in Iraq when we unilaterally dis, you know, disbanded the, their entire military and then spent 20 years dealing with the fallout um, because there was no professional military to deal with the, you know, the destabilization that we caused. And occupiers will never you know, solve that destabilization as we learned. But... I wanted to jump back because that was always a, an interesting kind of nuanced topic of why that 75% and, and yeah.